It's hard not to like the pelican. It's the world's largest water bird, and it usually lives at the coast. But here in Australia, pelicans do the most extraordinary thing. Every decade or so, some birds abandon the sea and journey thousands of kilometres inland to the scorched heart of the island continent, to one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. Why has been a mystery until now. But now we can reveal the secret life of the pelican, the outback nomad. The pelican is big by pelican standards. Just to stay alive, this female needs two kilos of fish a day. So it comes as no surprise that pelicans are found near the harbour. But what is surprising is that she's about to leave the sea behind and fly inland. An unknown force is drawing her to a place that comes alive maybe once in every decade. An incredible journey across country that is short on water, let alone fish. Why would a water bird abandon an easy life by the sea and head into the parched interior of Australia, over a thousand kilometres from the coast? She's well designed for her journey. With a wingspan of two and a half metres, she can soar on thermals as well as flap, perfect for long distance travel. And she's not alone. Many birds journey together in loose flocks. They spiral up, sometimes as high as 3,000 metres. And then they glide to the next landmark, travelling hundreds of kilometres over some of the most hostile territory on the planet. They can be airborne all through the day and into the night. the driest place on the hottest and driest continent on the planet. Rain here is at best sporadic and at worst non-existent. It's the last place on earth you'd expect to find a water bird. But our pelican is here, and she's seeking the outback's most sought-after commodity. It's the first clue that begins to explain her epic journey. Maybe she can sense distant weather systems, or maybe it's just by chance, but our pelican arrives with the rain. This is the second year in succession that the dry riverbeds are turned into rivers. A flood memory, ensuring they follow the same semi-saturated route and fill quickly. But the waterways flow not the short distance to the sea, but hundreds of kilometres inland, towards the lowest point in Australia. It's this water that drew her here. These flooded rivers are thought to be a route map remembered from journeys past, which guide her to her final destination. So already a picture is beginning to build. Our pelicans following a succession of temporary waterways, each with its own color signature that she reads like a color chart from high in the sky.
like all long-distant migrants, she needs to stop and refuel. So, although she'll put down at these temporary billabongs, she'll not stay long. There's something far more enticing in the desert to the southwest. But for now, she knows that where there's open water, there's a good chance of fish. And with the longest bill of any bird in the world, the Australian pelican has the means to catch herself a meal. It's sensitive to vibrations, which helps her locate fish in murky water. at the tip of the bill enables her to get a grip on slippery prey. And to increase the chance of catching food, pelicans work together. They drive fish ahead of them into the shallows and then plunge their bills into the water like a troop of synchronised swimmers. It's hard to imagine that there was no water here just a few weeks ago. But with the drought-breaking rains came not only birds, but also a dingo family. It's such a sporadic event, the pups experience running water for the very first time. Many types of birds are drawn to these water holes. But whatever the species, they'd better beware, for some won't be leaving. Outstaying a welcome here could be fatal, so our pelican is on her way again, to a place that's important to her and many others of her kind. This year's rains have been unusually long-lasting and widespread, so inland rivers have penetrated deep into the desert. It means our pelican and her flock can follow the water to where some haven't been for a decade and others have never been before. And there's still another 500 kilometres to go. It's taking them to one of the most unappealing places on the planet, into Australia's fiery centre. Heading into this desolate wilderness in the Lake Eyre drainage basin is Dr. Greg Johnston. Here we are in South Australia. Out here, even though it's completely dry, you get this amazing sight of uh, pelicans, which we'd normally think of, of as seabirds. But they come up here and they breed. 
one really interesting question is how on earth the pelicans find their way to Lake Eyre and why do they, they come to this particular area? And there's a lot of stories around about the pelicans knowing exactly where they're going and knowing exactly when the water is arriving and knowing exactly when the food's available. I don't think that's true. I think they probably use the rivers as, as highways. They, they look like highways when you, you see them from the sky. They're lines of, of green trees in the red desert. And, and the pelicans can find their way around. These pelicans are moving 600 kilometres a day quite easily. They're very long-lived birds. And so these birds are thinking about this landscape at a scale that we're not. But why would these birds want to be thinking about this place at all, when surely all they need is at the coast? To understand why, scientists are also looking at their stay-at-home cousins by the sea. Many of Australia's pelicans don't migrate inland. In this busy harbour north of Sydney, they live cheek by jowl with people. Even so, an offshore island seems a safe place to raise a family. Many pairs are breeding, with the first chicks already hatched. And some of their food is easy to come by. At 3.30 every day, come rain or shine, there's a free handout at the Entrance Memorial Park. The local pelicans are a tourist attraction. Who needs to go fishing when all the catering is laid on for free? Americans are highly adaptable and eager opportunists. So with regular food handouts, this population can stay here all year round. They seem to have little need to migrate inland. Yet other birds abandon this easy life and embark on a perilous journey into the desert. This is Lake Eyre, the biggest salt pan in the world. The salt is half a metre thick, and at 15 metres below sea level, it's the lowest point in Australia. It's blisteringly hot, and for 90 of the past 100 years, not a drop of rain has fallen here. It's hell on Earth, an unlikely place for a water bird. But Lake Eyre is also at the centre of a vast drainage basin that covers an area the size of France, Germany and Italy combined. And on very rare occasions, it floods. What was once an ancient inland sea becomes the largest lake in Australia. In a deep flood year, 100,000 pelicans arrive here, a third of Australia's total population. It's become pelican heaven. So important is the Lake Eyre population that scientists like Greg Johnston closely monitor the birds the moment they arrive. The reason why we want to find out what the pelicans are doing up here is so that we can know um, a, a little bit about how the deserts work and in particular that's important if we're going to manage the water resources in the desert. We're here in South Australia, it's the driest state and the driest continent on the planet and uh, we're still learning how to manage our water in this area and, and nature gives us the answers because pelicans have been finding water and making good use of it for many generations. 
Lake Eyre floods to four metres deep roughly every decade and fills entirely just four times in a century. This is a decade year, and the survey area is so vast, Greg is forced to take to the air himself. Thanks, Greg. Yourself, Mike? Good. Nice Excellent. To see you again. It's great to have a chance to come out here on the helicopter because it really gives you a pelican's eye view of the landscape. Yeah, so right, mate. So um, anywhere in particular you want to look at, there's uh, currently this is where the water is at the moment, all through here. Yeah. Good to check out some of the islands on the south coast of, of Lake Eyre South as well. So that'll be a good place to go first if we can. Yeah. So there's three little islands just off the tip of that peninsula and that's that's where we know they've read before. Righto. Well, we'll get out there and see what we can find. Good stuff. So the, the water hasn't quite filled the lake yet. Filling the lake only occurs every 3,000 years or so. Normally the lake's nowhere near full. E even in those years when there's a lot of water here and pelicans do breed. So these are the islands we're after. That looks like it, doesn't it? Yeah, it certainly does come out that way. Yeah. And then you've got little islands out here. Yeah. With flooding here such a rare and random occurrence, it's a mystery how the birds know when to come, especially from hundreds, if not thousands of kilometres away. The birds may follow the waterways to Lake Eyre, but how do they know that the rains have fallen in the first place? It seems there are more questions than answers in pelican life. But Greg is determined to find out more of those answers. The future of the Australian pelican may depend on it. For our female pelican, this place holds a special significance. It's where she was born over a decade ago, at the time of the last big flood. And now it's where she'll try to raise her own family. It's why they've all come, tens of thousands of pelicans arriving from all over Australia to breed. And here at Lake Eyre, Conditions are just right for a bumper breeding season. This is a rare sight. The last time that birds gathered here in such large numbers was at the start of the millennium. At touchdown, our pelican's first priority is to find a new partner, for pelicans don't mate for life. At this time, pouches take on a bright pink hue that's sure to attract the attention of potential mates. Then, both sexes engage in a serious bout of pouch rippling and bill clapping. A female might have several males in tow, and she leads them on a courtship procession around the colony. The male with the greatest stamina becomes the chosen partner. He sticks to her like a shadow, and if all bodes well, she'll lead him to her chosen nest site. The lake is popular because food is surprisingly plentiful. It's one of Mother Nature's miracles.
Before the flood, it was barren, desolate, just salt and sand. But as the basin fills, the eggs of tiny organisms that have lain entombed in the salt for many years suddenly stir. Brine shrimps develop, grow and reproduce in just a few days. All that was needed was water and an entire ecosystem bursts into life. At first, the lake holds fresh water, but as the salt crust on the lake bed dissolves, it gradually becomes saltier. For now, though, the shrimps are food for fish, some of them unique to Lake Eyre. And the pulse of water surging through the feeder streams produces far more fish than if the rivers were running full throughout the year. It's this superabundance of food that attracts pelicans. That's why they have come all this way to breed. Birds on the coast have very different tastes. The harbour birds are turning to less conventional foods to make up for a local shortage of wild-caught fish. And their diet is being monitored by a research team from the University of Technology in Sydney. The task is made easier because pelicans regurgitate food for their chicks. Birds in the outback feed on fish caught straight from the lake. But here, nearly half of the pelican's diet is junk food, fed to them by people, and much of the rest is free handouts. Here, pelicans join the queue when the garbage truck delivers a takeaway. Professor Richard Kingsford of the University of New South Wales is looking at how the desert and harbour birds compare. It seems that they're really highly reliant on having artificial food supplies. They're not getting all of their food from the sea and the estuary. They're having to go into these landfill areas and pick out protein there, which obviously helps them get through some fairly lean patches. Um, but they're obviously more and more reliant on those sorts of food items. And these scavenging pelicans don't depend solely on our waste. Oh, look, they're highly adaptable. I mean, they'll e eat invertebrates. Some of them will even eat other pelican young or any other birds that are around. And uh, there's even a record of one of them munching on a on a on a dog at some stage, a small chihuahua. So, <laughs> so those things just show just how adaptable these these animals are. But this kind of adaptability has its price, and premature deaths on the coast are common. The seaside might not be the perfect place to live and raise a family, after all. At Lake Eyre, our pelican and her partner have established their nest site. While she stands guard, he collects as much nest material as he can find. But somehow he must find his mate again in the crowded mass of pink and white. But they all look so alike.
pilfering is rife. Just a few blades of grass trigger a spate of ruffled feathers. With the nest ready for its new occupants, the first egg is laid. A second will follow in a few days. Both male and female share incubation duties for about a month. While still in their egg, the chicks chirp continually to the incubating parent, telling mum or dad if they're at a comfortable temperature or not. Then it's time for number one baby to chip its way out. For the parents, there's a pressure to get on with chick rearing. There's no telling how long the lake will have water and therefore how long the food will last. What we do know is that pelicans have been faced with the same race to breed at Lake Eyre for millions of years. Greg Johnston searches for old nest sites to collect eggs and bones. And some he's found point to an ancient lineage. We've got fossil pelicans from just east of Lake Eyre, which are 30 million years old. So we know that pelicans have been around here for a long time, and probably they've been doing much the same thing for all of that 30 million years. By studying the DNA in bone and egg fragments, he hopes to work out the history of the Lake Eyre birds. What we're doing is coming to Lake Eyre and we're, we're going to islands where we know that pelicans have bred and when they've bred, and then we're able to take bone samples and develop a genetic fingerprint for those populations. And we can even test whether it's the same birds that are breeding in Lake Eyre each time there's a breeding event here. Initial results from Dr Johnston's work indicate that birds do indeed return here time and time again. On the coast, a lot of the, the breeding colonies are, are in trouble. Some of them have been deliberately destroyed by people who are concerned about pelicans competing with them for fish. Um, some of them are, are subject to pollution and so on. But up here in the centre, you're dealing with much more pristine habitats. And so when the water comes into Lake Eyre and the fish breed up, then there's pretty much nothing to stop the pelicans. But they really do rely on that water. Management of this vital resource in Australia's driest state is currently a hot topic in conservation circles. And the future of at least one third of the country's pelican population very much depends on it. It's becoming clear that Greg Johnston's work at Lake Eyre is important for the long-term protection of pelicans, not only here, but throughout Australia and maybe beyond. In the breeding colony, events have moved on. Our pelican's chicks have hatched, one a couple of days before the other. Compared to other species, the pelican chick is slow to grow physically, but its brain and eyes develop rapidly. It's thought a well-developed visual sense is for when they eventually go travelling. They observe and remember their surroundings and so create a mental map of where they've been. When these chicks grow up, maybe it's this ability that will help them find their way back here. At first, the chicks are fed a regurgitated slurry of digested fish the dribbles from their parents' bill. After a couple of weeks, they move on to pre-digested solids. And 
and they have healthy appetites. They demand to be fed at least eight times a day. But while the parents are away, unguarded chicks are in danger. Scavenging silver gulls can just as easily turn into baby killers. They roam the breeding colonies in raucous gangs, seizing any opportunity to grab an unguarded youngster. Plump young chicks prove irresistible, for even baby killers have their own young to feed. When a parent returns with food, it can recognise its young because each chick has its own skin markings as well as different eye colours that vary from dark brown to white. Each chick instinctively reaches as high as it can in order to snatch the choice pieces of food. They'll remain in the nest until they acquire their first covering of silky, soft white down. But only if the lake and its fish last until they're fledged. At the harbour, pelican parents are kept equally busy by the demands of their own broods. But things are a little different here. A female breeds every year instead of every decade. But even though she produces two eggs, generally only one chick survives. Like the lake air birds, one egg hatches shortly before the other. But garbage and free handouts are just not enough to satisfy the colony of growing families. When food is limited, the older, stronger chick scoffs it all and eventually it'll kill its weaker sibling. This behaviour is rare at Lake Eyre, but as Professor Kingsford explains, it's common on the coast. One of the problems of these fringe dwellers that uh, nest on the coast and, and feed on the coast is that when they start breeding, if there's not enough food, it's really highly competitive. And obviously having to share that with your sibling is, is going to impact on your ability to survive. And you can get one of the chicks will actually kill the other chick that's just hatched out. and we generally tend to see that more along these coastal areas where we don't have as much food, whereas in the inland river systems, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot more productive, those lakes, because this constant and really prolific fish supply, and it's, it's just a case of then sort of popping off to the larder and getting another um, bill full of fish for your chicks. Although sporadic, the rich food supply at Lake Eyre makes the monumental effort to reach a transitory lake in the middle of a desert worthwhile. Even with so many birds, there's little competition for food. The water's brimming with life, and it's not only pelicans that are here to exploit it. 
It's a complex and lively wildlife community. Banded stilts arrived even before the pelicans. They feast on the brine shrimps and feed them to their own chicks. Along with the pelicans, Caspian terns are last to establish their breeding colony. They nest when the fish population is flourishing. Breeding at Lake Eyre is at its peak. Our pelican's chicks are now one month old, but they still depend on both parents for food. Having grown substantially bigger, they're even more demanding. Older youngsters reach right down their parents' gullet, each sibling trying to beat the other to any food down there. finally breaks free, her chick throws a tantrum. It's either short on oxygen after all that exertion, or it's drawing attention to itself and away from its sibling. Nobody really knows why, but they all do it. parents are away fishing, the adolescents gather together into a large creche. There's safety in numbers. There's more than a hundred birds in each nursery, and while they walk, they tone up their flight muscles and try out new feathers. But when they fledge, where will these birds go? It's something researchers from all over Australia are trying to discover. Pelican migration is high on the scientific agenda. At Outer Harbour in Adelaide, Jennifer Hayes is one of Greg Johnston's field team. Uh, this would be my tenth year for uh, helping out with the um, pelicans. Here, what we're doing today is catching these um, babies to wing tag them. We grab them by the beak first because, as you can see, they've got quite a nasty hook that can do us a bit of damage. So, if we just hold their beak first, then pick them up underneath, grab hold of their feet, and then just control their beak so that uh, they can't bite us, so it doesn't hurt them at all. No, that wasn't being good. 
Hey, just sit here like a good boy. There you are. Good boy. Hmm? Okay. These are juveniles from this year's brood, and a toddler's playpen is a handy way to contain them, ready for processing. Just hold the group, them. Oh, right. oh, precious. You growl at me, you'll get a wing tag. Hey? Growl at me and you'll get a wing tag. Even at this age, they're hefty birds, and with that stabbing bill, they're handled carefully. Once in the pen, they settle down, and then one at a time, their vital statistics can be recorded. Oh, you're the grumpy one. OK, well, I'll come back. No, 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 here we go. No, you're next. All right. OK, OK, come on. Okay. Each bird is given a wing tag with its own unique number, so anywhere it goes, it will be instantly recognised. Beaks are measured to check rate of growth. It tells whether they're getting sufficient food. Blood samples check for diseases and signs of pollutants. And a DNA analysis determines whether they're related to the lake air pelicans. But results so far suggest many will stay right here in Adelaide. Yeah, that's it. Good boy. Come on. Hey, don't do that. That's not nice. Come on. Off you go. Go on. Off you go. That way. Go on. Go on. Off you go. Go and tell your mates. We'll be back next week. Hey? Tell them. At Lake Eyre, our pelican's chicks are three months old and about to start flight training. A short but successful maiden flight. Once the birds are airborne properly, they take note of the landscape and local landmarks, developing a GPS-like sense that will enable them to find their way back here again. And it will help them journey from one water source to the next as they range across the outback. youngsters leave home, their parents try for a second brood, and maybe even a third, as long as the water remains and food is still plentiful. Down at the coast, the University of Technology team, led by Dr Ursula Munro, is checking on the health of the harbour birds. They're measuring chicks and counting eggs. Oh, it's a one and day old one. OK. 19.1. Everybody equates pelicans with a coastal bird. But in fact, the pelicans that are doing best of all are those ones in the desert. So these are the fringe dwellers, and I guess they don't get nearly as much reproductive success, number of chicks off, as you would on some of the inland systems. Generally, because the food's just not there in the sort of abundance that we see from our inland rivers. The data indicates that the coastal birds are not doing as well as you'd expect. And a lack of food is just one of the drawbacks to living with people. A bird smeared with oil has lost much of its waterproofing, so the parent and its offspring are unlikely to survive for long. A 
At Lake Eyre, time is running out for our female second brood. The chicks have been doing well so far, but she has to get them to flight stage before the lake disappears. Rivers no longer feed the lake, and in the intense heat, evaporation is causing the shoreline to recede at a staggering three metres a day. As the water level drops, salt is concentrated and the salinity rises. So many birds are moving out. Pelicans have special glands in their bill to get rid of salt. So some stay, at least for the time being. But as the lake disappears, so does the food. Our pelican has to fly a 100 kilometer round trip to find fish at other waterways. She needs at least another few weeks of food and water for her brood to fledge successfully. But it's a risk for her to stay much longer. The air temperature is soaring to well over 40 degrees Celsius, and parents with younger chicks are struggling to keep them alive. They shade the youngsters as best they can during the hottest part of the day. But conditions are worsening, and right on cue are the omens of death. Black kites time their own breeding cycle to coincide with the glut of pelican casualties. Abandoned nests mean there are rich pickings for all the scavengers. Some will never make the flight out. At this moment, Lake Eyre might not seem the best place to raise a family. But in the main, pelican parents here do well. And their breeding success or failure is an important litmus test for the health of this environment. One of the really interesting aspects of waterbird ecology is that people understand waterbirds need water. They understand that if you have lots of waterbirds, if you have lots of pelicans in a, in a place, and, and they continue to increase in numbers, then there's some reflection that the environment's doing OK. As soon as you see numbers starting to decline, then you get a very good idea that the environment's probably in trouble, and usually it's because in the water world, in Australia in particular, that we are denying the productive wetland habitat of the water it needs to generate the productivity in the fish that inevitably flow through to the pelicans. In Australia, we don't have a very good record of managing our water particularly well. And pelican populations right across the, the southeast of Australia have gone down measurably over the last 30 years or so. And that's got a lot to do with the way we're, we're managing those rivers in that, that part of the country. Unfortunately now, we're moving our focus to, to the inland rivers. And these are the last bastion of, of a lot of these inland breeding birds. And if, if we wreck these rivers that flow into Lake Eyre, then the, the whole system will pretty much be gone. Australia's inland waterways are among the world's last untamed river systems. Vital arteries that pulse life-giving waters into the arid interior. When the water's gone, so are the birds. And much else besides. Our pelican's second brood is finally airborne, so they can all leave Lake Eyre together.
It's a classic case of boom and bust ecology. A short-lived food bonanza and successful breeding season one minute and nothing the next. And where they all go is throwing up even more questions. Lake Eyre birds have been found as far away as Fiji in the Pacific. But do they all head for the sea? Or do some join a perpetual desert carousel, searching for where the rains are falling and the water flows? It could be many years before the floodwaters return to Lake Eyre, so our female pelican may not breed again for another decade or more. But with her incredible memory, her skill at riding the thermals, and her ability to seek out water in this unforgiving landscape, she'll be back. That is, as long as there is water here. <laughs>